eerily haunting true stories about remote abandoned locations rich in history come with us now travels from state to state if you dare <laughs> Be the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has a folder or something filled. Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. This episode contains content that may be alarming to some listeners. The topic presented today is of a graphic nature and we'll be discussing violence against children. We do our best to talk about these topics with respect and sincerity and we hope you all join us whenever you feel ready and able. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, the clouds finally broke. They did. We have a little bit of sunshine this fabulous Sunday. For one day. For one day and then the rain comes back. Yep, for the next three days. I love the weather though. I do too, actually. It gives us a little bit of a change. In California, it's kind of the same old, same old. I don't even know why we have weather people because they just sit there and it's like, it's, I don't know, it kind of reminds me of, oh, what was the name of that movie with Jim Carrey where every day is a sunny day and he was in that Truman show. Oh, the Truman show. Like that's you're asking me? me? Oh, that's true. <laughs> you're the one who doesn't watch movies. That's people out me. there. I know. But yeah. So I'm liking it, loving it. If you're a Patreon, then you know what we're talking about. Yes, absolutely, because <laughs> Gina does not know movies. I don't. So, And that's okay. It is. You know what? You do better things with your time. I do. Well, so. I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far, but <laughs> <laughs> but okay. But, but I don't watch movies. <laughs> yeah, I don't watch movies. <laughs> but, um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going back to Texas again. Yeah, we are. Not the killing fields, though. No. But close. Yeah. I mean, it's all in the it's same It's all location. right there in the same area. So this is about one of Houston's most notorious mass murders yeah. in Texas. Yeah. That's what it oh. was labeled, right? Yeah. Houston's mass murder. Um, yeah. So we're talking about a man named Dean Coral. Yes. And he was um, called the Candyman. And also the Pied Piper. The Pied Piper. Yes, because he would lure children. Yeah. So, and he was one of the most prolific serial killers. Yeah. Before Ted Bundy. Bundy. Um, he had a, another guy who kind of looked up to him. Yeah. You know, if that's kind of a sick way to say it. Yeah. But John Wayne Gacy. Mm-hmm. So. And this is a part one. Next week we will go into, because there is... Um, there is a connection uh, between him and John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. Dean Coral. So it's creepy. Uh, so next week we'll we're gonna go into into that because that gets a little twisted. Yeah. But today we're gonna talk about Dean Arnold Coral, the yes. candy man. He was born on December twenty fourth, nineteen thirty nine in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to Arnold Edwin Coral and Mary Robinson. He also had a younger brother named Stanley. When Dean was seven, his parents divorced for the first time. (laughs) And that same year, he was um, diagnosed with rheumatic fever. He said that he was such a sweet boy. You know, he had empathy. He wasn't one of those where you can say like, oh, you know, he he, there was always something off about him. You know, he killed animals, you know, things like that. It wasn't like that, you know. And a lot of times, I think, too, with a lot of serial killers, like a lot of them have you know, been in accidents, stuff like that, where they've sustained like a head injury, some traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. So he had many medical difficulties. And because of this, he was very shy and rarely socialized with other kids because he wasn't able to participate in a lot of sports and, and, um, things happening at the school, you know, that were activities that were going on. He kind of sat to the side and, you know, looked on. So he wasn't able to get that socialization piece in with the other kids in 1950, his parents reconciled because they lived in Indiana, but his father, Arnold was in the military he had went down to Memphis. The mom followed so that he can still have contact with his children. And they ended up getting married again in 1950 for the second time. 
but three years later, they would divorce again. Coral's mom would retain custody of him and his brother and would go on to marry marry a traveling clock salesman and have another child with him. (laughs) (laughs) That is so cute. A traveling clock salesman. I mean, mean, I'm not sure how much money these days you would make doing that, but obviously back then it it did the job. (laughs) Yeah, that's a pretty awesome job. The family moved to Vidor, Texas, opened a candy making business called Pecan Price. While in high school, Dean and his brother Stanley both worked there. Even though he worked long hours, Dean was able to maintain his grades. He was average, you know, kid. Yeah. He wasn't, you not know. Not good, not bad. Not good, not bad, yeah. But was known as a loner by his peers. He was also known to occasionally date girls. In the summer of 1958, Dean graduated and the family moved to Houston where they sold most of their products and they opened up their own Pecan Price shop. In 1960... Dean's mother asked him to move back to Indiana with his grandmother after she was widowed. Dean packed up to move to Indiana to be with his grandmother. There he dated a local girl, and it was said that this girl, she actually proposed to Coral, but he turned her down. Well, and we'll see why. I mean, thank God, but... She dodged a bullet. She did. Yeah, she's probably looking back on that time going, Thank God. Right? By this time, Dean's mother's marriage was failing, and so Dean moved back to Houston, Texas to help out with the candy business. Because she got divorced, she ended up opening in 1963 her own candy store, and she called it Coral's Candy Company, and she would name Dean the vice president. Imagine being that young and being a vice president. By this time, you know, he was born in... 1939 and this is 1963 i'm going to do my math in front of everybody 39 49 59 he was older 60 61 no he's only 22 23 years well, old i mean it's a candy oh. it's a candy store that is true but try to get my son who's 21 to run anything <clears throat> i love him to pieces <laughs> but um so um that same year one of the teenage boys that worked at the company complained about Dean making sexual advances towards him. Oh, I wonder why he turned down that proposal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Dean's mom just fired the boy. You know, back in those days, it's funny how that's all that would happen. Yeah, I'm just going to get rid of the boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll just get rid of him. Yeah. I mean, and granted, it's a, you know, it's her kid. Yeah. So you're going to take your kid's side and just, I mean, I yeah. feel like in these days, if something like that happened, it would be a little bit more a little serious. more more serious but yeah back then you just okay we'll get rid of him and get crazy. someone else i know so a year later cora was drafted into the u.s army because at this time in the 60s it's the vietnam war was sent to fort polk louisiana for a 10-month training it was um there that dean realized he was a homosexual and had his first sexual relations why did that sound so strange when i said that that he was homosexual he was a homosexual <laughs> Why am I sound? He was homosexual and he had his first sexual relations. After being honorably discharged, he went back home and returned to working at Coral's Candy Company. Upon returning to work, Dean would continue to make advances towards the male employees. So in 1967, Dean met tw- a 12 year old boy named David Owen Brooks. Remember that name. And the two became close friends. Brooks admired Coral and considered him a substitute father. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of age difference between them, you know. Yeah, I mean, tw- that's a ten year. But age he's still, difference. or even he's no, still even young, more. you know. Like he's still, um, he's still young. At this time, Dean's about twenty six year old, twenty six yeah. years old, and Brooks, David Owen Brooks, is only twelve years old. Yeah, that's a baby. Yeah, when you think about your kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. he's a baby. Yeah. Uh, So Dean Coral, um, kind of, I'm just going to give you a background on a little bit of what, what he would do, what his MO was. Uh, So he would target males between 13 to 20 years old. Uh, Coral would take these boys to his apartment or to his home and he moved around quite a bit. Did he live on his own with his mom? Like kind of both. He had apartments, he he had homes. Um, He had, you know, he kind of moved around. Vice president of a candy company. Yeah. Living the life. Yeah. 
And these kids would know him because he would sell candy and yeah. kids would want to go to this of candy course. shop. I so. mean, that was a perfect place to meet young boys was at a candy shop, sure. you yeah. know, or just young kids in general. So Coral would take these boys to his apartment or home with promises of alcohol or drugs. Once he had them, he would strip all of their clothes off and tie them to a plywood torture board that he kept in his bedroom. They were raped, beaten, and tortured through many various means. The bodies were then tied in a plastic sheet and buried in one of three massive graves. So he had three different places that he was burying these um, bodies. So one of them being a boat shed in southwest Houston, which Shannon and I actually went to visit. Yes. And um, another one was um, near Lake Sam Rayburn. And then another one, High Island Beach. So those were three different areas that he was burying these bodies. Occasionally, Coral would force his victims to either call or write letters to their parents explaining their absence. And that actually helped the Houston Police Department's assumption with the, that the victims were runaways. That yeah. just kind of made it all make sense to them, I think. That was um, easier for them. Just, oh, okay, yeah. they ran away. Yeah, here's their That's letter. That's so sad because these... Young boys are having to write these letters to their family, yeah. knowing what's going to happen. To exactly. Them. Exactly. Breaks my heart. Yeah, it's terrible. Uh, Coral was also known to keep keys from their from his victims as trophies, which is, it's I mean, so I think it's really common that, you know, killers keep their keep a little trophy. Yeah. Keep but their keys. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> and I'm really curious as to know, because I know that we found like, you know, the victims, where they all lived because they had to live in close proximity to one another because of the candy shop and where yeah. Dean was living. Yeah. And so I'm going to get that map together. Maybe we'll have it all up, but we can kind of yeah, we can just do drop pins of kind of see where they were all where at. Where they were all at, yeah. Yeah, where sure. they were located. So I'm going to talk about uh, David Owen Brooks. And if you remember, that was the 12-year-old that Dean met working at the candy company. So David Owen Brooks first met Dean Coral when he was 12 years old and he was only in sixth grade. He was one of many kids who would go socialize at the Coral candy shop. Brooks would later tell authorities that Coral had sexually abused him since the age of 12. In 1970, when Brooks was 15 years old, he went to Coral's apartment unannounced. He walked in and caught Coral sexually assaulting two teenage boys, uh, James Glass, who was 14 years old, and Danny Yates, who was also 14. Brooks said Coral jumped up and said, I'm just having some fun. Coral would later tell Brooks that he would buy him a car if he stayed quiet. Brooks agreed, and Coral would go on to buy him a green Corvette. Wow. Coral would later admit to Brooks that he murdered the two boys. Coral and Brooks would then make a deal that Coral would pay him $200 for every boy that he could lure to his apartment. And Brooks agreed. In 1970, that was a lot of money, especially for a young 15 year old boy. Yeah. It's and I think it's $200 to them. Yeah. I think $200 to somebody that age and now is a lot of money. But yeah. then back in the 70s, Imagine how much money that was. Yeah. So. I can't imagine how much this guy was making at the candy shop. Like, it's just. Yeah. I mean, I, able, yeah. Just, I, that's, I was wondering that too. Like, you know, even back then, like that 200 bucks was a lot of money. And yeah. for him to be pulling in all these kids, like just popping off 200 bucks here, 200 bucks there. Like that's. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been a banging candy company. I don't know. They must have had <laughs> right. good candy. Um, So I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to go through his victims. So this is going to be just a little tough to listen to. Just yeah. a little. Yeah. This, I'm not going to go this into great detail. Um, but yes, these are all, these are all young kids and these are just his known victims. There's yeah. many out there that are still not found unidentified the whole thing. So in early 1969 is when he met, um, David Owen Brooks and that was his that's his first accomplice and that's the the one that we just spoke on in 1970 um, on September 25th Jeffrey Conan 18 years old was strangled and asphyxiated with a cloth gag and buried at High Island Beach 
On December 13th, 1970, James Glass and Danny Yates 14 both were raped, strangled with a cord, and buried in the boat shed. Then we go to 1971 on January 30th. Donald Waldrop, 15, and his brother Jerry was 14. They were both raped, strangled, and tortured and buried in the boat shed. And between January 30th and March 9th, uh, Elmer Wayne Henley, uh, age 14, he was originally intended to be a victim, but he turned out to be Coral's second accomplice, who would later go on to work with Brooks hand in hand to so them two would work to together. lure boys. So a little bit about him. I just want to touch a little bit about him because he plays quite a big role in this. So Elmer Wayne Henley was born and raised in Houston, Texas in 1956. He was the oldest of four boys. His dad was an alcoholic and very abusive towards him, his brothers and his mom. When he was 14, his parents got divorced and him and his mom got custody of all four boys. Up until the time Henley was uh, doing good in school, but after the divorce, he would take um, he would take on a part time job to help his mom out with the finances. I think they were really struggling with money. Um, so the two hundred dollars was very enticing. Well, and that's why, yeah, be, and that's why he he dropped out of school to work a part time job. Um, at the age of fifteen, his grades started to drop, and he just completely dropped out of school. Around this same time, the winter of 1971, is when David Owen Brooks lured Henley to Coral's apartment. So for unknown reasons, Coral spared Henley and ended up offering him the same fee that he earlier offered Brooks of $200 for any boy that he could lure to Coral's apartment. He would go on to tell Henley that he was a member of a slavery ring. For several months, Henley ignored Coral's offer, but in, in early 1972, he finally accepted Coral's offer because his family had come into very hard times. So I think in the beginning, maybe this turned out to be, uh, this just was meant to be like, you yeah. know, I'm just trying to help my family. <clears throat> I, I don't think at that age, anybody, a boy can, or a girl, any child can process what's to come <laughs> yeah know? um they just probably see money and he's able to help his mom he's the oldest so he's probably you know taking on the role of the man in the family and he just wants to wants to help his family so on march 9th randall randall harvey 15 years old was shot in the head raped and buried in the boat shed his body wasn't identified until 2008 Uh, May 29th of 1971, David Hilgeist, 13, and Gregory Winkle, 16, both raped, strangled uh, with the cord and buried in the boat shed. August 17th, 1971, Reuben Watson Haney, 17, raped, strangled, and buried in the boat shed. Um, An unspecified date somewhere in the time span of 1971 through 1972, um, they called him the swimsuit boy. Um, he was believed to be between 15 and 19 years old, and he was buried in the boat shed, and his body was found on August 9th, 1973. And that date will come into play um, in a little bit. So in 1972, February 9th, William Branch Jr., 17, was strangled and buried in the boat shed. His body was not identified until 1985. Uh, March 24th, 1972, Frank Aguirre, 18 years old. This was Elmer Wayne's, uh, Elmer Wayne Henley's friend and Rhonda Williams' uh, boyfriend. And those two will come into play later also. Um, he was strangled and buried at High Island Beach. April 20th, 1972, Mark Scott, 17 years old, strangled and buried um, and buried at High Island Beach. His body was uh, never recovered. May 21st, 1972, Johnny DeLome, age 16, raped, strangled, and shot in the head and buried in High Island Beach. Also on May 21st, Billy Balch, age 17, raped, strangled, and buried at High Island Beach. July 19th, 1972, Stephen Sickman, age 17, bludgeoned with an unspecified object, cracking several ribs and fatally strangled with a nylon cord and buried at High Island Beach. Stephen's body was misidentified in 1993, but would go on to be correctly identified in 2011. 
August 21st, 1972, Roy Bunton, age 19, shot twice in the head and buried in the boat shed. Misidentified in 1973 and would go on to be correctly identified in 2011. October 2nd, Wally Simino, age 14, buried in the boat shed. Also on October 2nd, Richard Hembry, age 13, shot in the mouth and buried in an, un- in an unknown location. November 12th, 1972, Richard Richard Kepner, age 19, raped, strangled, and buried at High Island Beach. His body was identified in 1983. Now we're into 1973. February 1st, 1973, Joseph Lyles, age 17, strangled and buried at Jefferson County Beach. His body was found in 1983 and identified in 2009. June 4th, 1973, William Ray Lawrence, age 15, he was kept alive for three days. He was raped, strangled with the cord, and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. June 15th, Raymond Blackburn, 20, strangled and buried at Sam at Lake Sam Rayburn. July 7th, Homer Garcia, age 15, shot in the head and chest and left to die in Coral's bathtub. Uh, then he was buried in at Lake Sam Rayburn. He was... Um, he basically was left to bleed to death in his bathtub. In the bathtub. Yes. And I was going to say a lot of this information was given to the police because of Henley and yes. Brooks. Okay. Yes. Because there's a lot of it. It's very detailed in the yes. information where they were found. And yeah. Uh, July 12th, John Sellers, age 17, shot four times in the chest and buried at High Island Beach. July 19th, Michael Balch, age 15, brother of Billy Balch, who had been murdered by Coral on the 21st, May 21st, 1972. (laughs) So Michael was raped, strangled, and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. Michael's body would be identified in 2010. And you'll see here there's a couple of brothers. Yeah. So imagine these families are not just losing one, but two. And this one, two different years. Mm -hmm. You know, he got one and then he got the other one. Yep. Disgusting. Uh, July 25th, Marty Jones, age 18, and Charles Carey Cobble, age 17, both shot and buried in the boat shed. August 3rd, James Stanton Dramala, age 13, raped, strangled, and buried in the boat shed. So those are, I know that was hard to listen to, but I just felt like they all needed to be. They all needed to be mentioned. Mentioned. They're all victims of. Yes. Dean and. Um. It's interesting when you were saying that in 1971, he had met Henley and said, hey, I'm going to proposition you. And then it wasn't until 1972 when Henley actually started helping. So all the ones you listed after Henley in 71, it was Brooks or yeah. Coral yeah. who lured them. Yeah. So. And I just, I feel like not to make any excuses or, you know, whatever the case yeah. may be for him, I just feel like. You know, in the beginning, he he wasn't interested. He didn't want to. And it wasn't until, you know, his family fell on hard times that he decided to take him up on the offer. So in 1973, you know, the murders stop. And we're going to go into the reason why. So on August 7, 1973, Henley was now 17 years old. He invited his friend Timothy Curley to attend a party at Dean's house. Timothy agreed, but at the last minute, they were joined by Timothy's girlfriend, Rhonda Williams. And remember, this is the Rhonda Williams who lost her boyfriend to Dean already. So I'm just going to focus back on one. I have questions, but it's such a tight community. Like it's such a small community that you're running into siblings that he's murdering, you know, boyfriends of, you know, people. They're all connected, kind of. They all, you know, knew each other. Mm -hmm. And um, when... Um, Gina had mentioned the two boys, like if there's two boys in one date, it's usually because they were friends, they were walking together and they got caught together. Yeah. So, um, they were friends that were killed together and all these boys are going missing. I was just wondering, you know, what are they scared? High alert in, you know, cause I know when we talked about the killing fields with all these women going missing, people were scared, you know, and 
around the time that all these girls were missing, at the same time, these boys are missing. Yeah. But like you said, they're dismissing them as runaways. Runaways, yeah. Yeah. So that night, Rhonda's father had attacked her after drinking too much alcohol, so she decided to wait outside her house while her dad sobered up. Henley felt bad for Rhonda and invited her to join the party, too. Coral initially really got angry about them bringing a female over to his apartment, but after hearing about Rhonda's father, he calmed down. They drank and smoked, and Coral waited for them to pass out. Pass out. He's very patient. Yeah. <laughs> He's got to be. <laughs> I know. Henley woke up to find himself gagged as Coral was putting handcuffs on his wrist. So at this time, Coral is so pissed off that he brought the girl over that he's actually handcuffing him, Henley. Mm-hmm. The one who brought point. them to him. Yeah. While Timothy and Rhonda were still unconscious, they were strapped next to him in the same manner. When Coral saw that Henley was awake, he removed the gag and said that he was going to kill them all because he brought Rhonda to the house. Henley then made a deal with Coral that if he released him, that he would participate in the torture murder of Timothy and Rhonda. So Coral agreed. Coral and Henley then dragged Timothy and Rhonda to Coral's bedroom where they strapped them to a torture board. Coral gave Henley a knife and told him to cut off Rhonda's clothes and that he was to rape and kill her by himself while Coral tended to Timothy. At this point, both Timothy and Rhonda had woken up. Henley then removed Rhonda's gag and started to cut her clothes, at which time Rhonda said to Henley, is this for real? To which Henley responded, yes. Rhonda then asked him, are you going to do anything about it? Rhonda saying this caused Henley for the first time to question his actions. Henley asked Coral if he could take Rhonda to another room. However, Coral ignored him. Henley then grabbed Coral's pistol and shouted that this had gone too far and it had to stop. Coral then left Timothy and yelled at Henley to kill him. Coral started to come closer to Henley, taunting him, and Henley started to panic. Coral then yelled at Henley, you won't do it. Henley fired the gun, one time hitting Coral in the forehead, but the bullet failed to penetrate his skull. That's crazy. I've never heard of, like... And I feel like it was pretty close range. Pretty close range. You shoot a bullet at someone's head, but it did not penetrate his skull. I mean, it's a pistol, so it's not. Okay. I mean, it's not. I'm not familiar to. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's still a gun regardless. Yeah. But. But it's not like a shotgun or something. Yeah. Okay. Coral continued to walk towards Henley and he fired two more shots into his left shoulder. Turning around, Coral left the room, walking down the hallway Henley followed him and shot three more times into Coral's back, killing him. Henley then set Timothy and Rhonda free. While Henley just wanted to leave, Timothy finally convinced him to call the police and explain to them what happened. Henley was arrested and then went on to confess his and Brooke's involvement in the Coral murders. He then told the authorities the locations of where the victims' bodies had been buried. So this is where all the information came from. Yes. Um regarding the victims and where they were found right because at this point i don't even think they would have found the majority of those victims probably not you know officers from several houston area police agencies converged on a boat storage shed and began opening the shallow graves they were led to the site by 17 year old elmer wayne henley henley told police in suburban pasadena that he had killed a man who boasted of the murders of several young people during the grave digging operations, Henley called his mother and told her the story on a mobile telephone. Who? Mama. Who's this? It's Wayne. Yes, this is Mama, baby. Mama? Yeah. I killed Dean. Wayne? Ma'am? What are you doing? Yeah, yes. Oh, God. Where are you? Um, it's all right. Wayne? It's all right. It's all right. Where are you? Well, I'm out of his warehouse. Where? Out of that warehouse he keeps. <laughs> Can I come out there? Yeah, yes, yes. No. Is that a hand park? She can't, no, you can't come. I'm, I'm with the police, Mama. Henley told police he killed 33-year-old Dean Allen Coral during a party at Coral's house. Henley said Coral had threatened him with a pistol and a knife, trying to force him into unnatural sex acts. 
Henley told police Carl had bragged about killing several young men and putting their nude bodies in shallow graves in the rutted stall. After further police questioning, Henley said as many as 18 or 19 bodies might be buried in the stall. And Henley said there are other graves on a stretch of beach along the Texas Gulf Coast and at a lake in East Texas. Henley and police traveled to the lake site to look for the additional graves. A Houston police lieutenant says as many as 25 or 30 murder victims might be involved in the case. He says it's the work of a perverted maniac. So, Henley was indicted for and found guilty of six murders. Brooks, who attempted to portray himself as a silent partner, who was not present for any rapes and murders, was indicted on four murders and found guilty of one. Both men were sentenced to life in prison. Elmore Wayne Henley is currently incarcerated and serving six consecutive life sentences at the Mark W. Michael Unit in Anderson County, Texas. In August of 2022, Henley applied for compassionate release for medical reasons. He was told that at this time his request would not be considered. The state will not release what exactly his medical situation is. He has been reviewed for parole more than 20 times, all of which had been denied. Henley will be eligible for parole again in 2025. David Owens Brook was incarcerated at the Ramsey unit and later died at Galveston Hospital on May 28, 2020 of complications from COVID. They also, I just want to go on to talk about just a little bit um, because Rhonda, we had looked up yesterday, like kind of, you know, Where's Rhonda Williams now? She mm-hmm. was one of the victims. And, you know, how are they doing? Where are they now? So I know that there was one account, according to Henley, what happened that day. But I'm going to just read what Rhonda's account was of that um, as one of the survivors. And this is, mind you, 40 years later. Right. Um, that she's finally telling her story. So... She says that um, when she was young, um, she had gone through a lot. She was sexually assaulted. Um, She was raped as a three-year-old and four-year-old child. She was in and out of foster homes as a child. And so she said that she was repeatedly beaten um, by her drunk and now deceased father. So she says, screaming is one of those things that I would not have done because I knew it not get you in any more, because I knew it would get you in more trouble. So she knew Elmer Wayne Henley as a boy from the neighborhood she grew up in. On that August night in 1973, Henley heard William's drunk father threatening her and climbed into her bedroom window to help her escape. She states that they creep down the stairs. Henley's recollection, Henley's recollection of the night was that she was already waiting outside. Yeah. Henley drove Williams and another teen to Coral's Pasadena home. They partied. When they awoke, she was hot hogtied. She says that Coral started kicking her and saying, wake up, wake up. Coral untied Henley, but took Timothy and Rhonda into a bedroom and lashed them to his handmade torture board. And we are going to have pictures up, obviously, yeah. on our YouTube channel of what this torture board looked like. Yeah, it's like horrible. just a piece of plywood yeah, that it, he would tie them to, basically. It's crazy. Yeah. And I believe that he had one in his van and he had one in his bedroom. It's just, He's driving around with one. Yeah. Uh, so she could, she says that she always believed that Henley wasn't going to hurt her. Like right. he was, or cause he already saved her from the father. So she really trusted, um, Henley and not hurting her. But, um, Henley at one point had laid down next to her and told her that he was afraid that he wasn't going to be able to save her. So he was going to sit down with me. This is Rhonda talking. So he was going to sit down with me you know, lay down with me like he'd been doing when we talked and he was going to put the gun by my head while we were talking and then he was just going to shoot me. So she thought she was going to die that night. Yeah. But she didn't want to scream, you know, like she said. 
But she said the fact that I wasn't hysterical and I just kept looking to Wayne to get me out of there. It, Wayne Henley. Yeah. He had always been my protector. So, yes, I was like, when are you going to get me out of this? He stood at my feet and just all of a sudden told Dean this couldn't keep going on. He couldn't let him keep killing his friends and that it had to stop. Dean looked up and he was surprised. So he started getting up and he was like, you're not going to do anything to me. And then Wayne, he had the gun raised already and he just started shooting. So that's her record collection of what happened that night it's pretty similar you know and it's funny because um I was just recently listening to a podcast about um a cold case and they're interviewing um a couple of these people 30 40 50 years later and they swear that they remember specific certain things and the way that they happened and and that's not how they were yeah. so I think who know I mean yeah in this case it doesn't matter what happened it doesn't it, she but, got out yeah she survived but at the same time like you know to go back to all these cold cases and then try to talk to these people all these years later who in their mind remember things like a specific way yeah you know, who knows? And it's from your perception. Like, you know, she's laying down on the ground. She's taken to another room. Henley has his version of it because he's, you know, in yeah. a different room. So, and things that are being said and to come up with the story, I can barely tell you exactly what I did yesterday. Right. So it's like, it's really hard 40 years later to say exactly, exactly what, what happened, mm -hmm. especially with that trauma. Of course. You know, so, but um, I just wanted to get both their perspectives in this case in it I just found it interesting that you know that she was willing to talk about it 40 years later yeah so, and um I want to um I just want to kind of like take it now to the present day yes um and talk about uh Tim Miller and if we remember Tim Miller is um the founder of EquiSearch in Texas and he is the father of Laura Miller, who we talked about on the episode, one of the episodes of the Texas Killing Fields. She was a victim of um, another serial killer. Yes. And so, he started like this foundation where yes. he helps um, victims and families, families of victims of murders. Right. In the Houston area. Yeah. So he has, because this all happened around the same time. Yes. This was all happening at the same time. Like so. we said, like all these boys, I mean, this is 28 boys and they think it's even upwards of 44 yes. boys. And then we have the Texas Killing Fields where they only focus on the females and yeah. young females as that, like around the same age too. And that is still going on today. Yeah. There's still bodies being dumped there. Yes. Today. In and present so you time. have all these females and what was that like in the thirties, like at 30, like 33, 30, yeah, like over 33 bodies, over 33 bodies over there. That's a total of what is that? 70, uh, over, you know, over 70, over 70, 70 kids, adolescents mm -hmm. gone missing. Yeah. And Boys those are and just the ones that have been identified and that they know are missing. Yes. You know, there's, there's so many that, if they, yeah, they dismissed a lot of them as runaways. So how many more did you they don't dismiss know. as runaways? Exactly. Yeah. So, so Tim Miller, he believes that there could be, you know, up to 20 more victims out there. And I think one of the reasons why he feels this is because when, um, Henley, um, when Henley went to show the authorities, where these bodies were buried. Um, he went to the boat shed. He took them to this boat shed. And like I said, Shannon and I were able to visit that area where the boat shed was. And it's just this huge open area. And um, not really an area where, I mean, I guess if there's, Again, things look different. So now I wouldn't say it's a place that you could bury bodies, but back then I'm sure it was just an open area. Yeah. Um, Probably less houses in the area. Yeah. And stuff like that. Um, as it sets now, it's it, kind it of like. It still looks even 
It is industrial, open. but it looks like industrial. Like it's more businesses. There's buildings there. Yeah, there's buildings. Yeah. Um, and other boat sheds. Yeah. So when he told the authorities where these bodies were buried, the authorities brought inmates from the local jail to dig for these bodies. Mind you, they were not wearing any protection, nothing. They're just out there digging for these bodies, finding bones. There there was actually a map of where these bodies were buried in the boat shed. And so they were digging for these bodies. And then I think when it when attention got brought to what was happening and, you know, their knee deep in God knows what, the yeah. search was called off. And so they weren't able to recover a lot of these bodies. Or and, identify all of them. Yeah. And so I think that um, Tim Miller feels that there are probably more bodies buried, not only in the boat shed area, but in other places. I mean, they, we already have three locations. Who knows? There might be more locations. Right. And his last, um, Coral's last address was in Pasadena, Texas, uh, at 2020 Lamar Road. And that is where a lot of boys were, um, were taken and, and strangled and raped and tortured, tortured there. And that is also the house that Dean Coral was killed in. That's where he was when he was shot by Henley. So, um, Tim Miller, he says they actually, this is a quote from him. He said, they actually killed so many boys that the heartless predators couldn't remember exactly where they put the victims. And I think that's exactly, he's exactly right. So in August of 2021, uh, Texas Equisearch, which is what he, his, what he founded, uh, began excavating Coral's home the home in Pasadena. The house that we went to go visit? Yes, so Shannon and I went to go visit this house too. Um, And it's funny because um, when we were there, the windows were all boarded up and it was vacant. You could tell it was vacant. Um, It didn't look like run down per se. No, no. But there were no windows. I think at some time, somebody did live there. They did purchase it. They did. There were people that lived there after. Yeah, they re-renovated it. Um, but I don't think that it, it was, um, had been lived in for quite a while. Yeah. And so in August of 2021, Texas EquiSearch, along with Tim Miller, went and excavated the whole backyard. It was a daunting task, digging for bodies in one of the largest murder cases Houston's ever seen. Chances were slim, but we knew if we didn't do anything... There was no chance. While the search didn't turn up anything at the former home of serial killer Dean Coral in Pasadena, it did bring up old memories for a man who claims he had a strange encounter with Coral's accomplice, Elmer Wayne Henley, in 1972. Well, I was alone walking down the street and a young man pulled up next to me and said, hey, man, where in the hell are you going? And he said it in a way like he had known me all my life. James tells k 11 he got in the car. They drove around the Heights and Henley promised him beer and a good time. Eventually, they ended up at a home. He says there were two other men and a woman, but Henley told him they had to wait for the woman to leave. But James told us he got a bad feeling and got out of the car and ran away, later realizing what he might have escaped. Everything came about in the news. We're... Uh, Coral had been killed and, and it all came out. And that's when uh, when I recognized Dean Coral, or not Coral, uh, Elmer Henley. There's, there's the fellow who picked me up. So uh, really, that's my story. I got away. James says he never went to police because nothing happened. And because of that, KHU 11 can't confirm his story. But victims advocate Andy Kahn says over the years, he's heard from families about other possible victims. So I'm not surprised because this case definitely resonates with the people of Houston and for those that, you know, have been around for, you know, 40, 50 some odd years, no one is ever going to forget what at that time was the largest serial killings in this country's history. Texas EquiSearch says they are not done. There are other areas of interest and they plan to search them in the coming weeks. He felt like 
this house was just an eyesore in this neighborhood and and talking to all of the neighbors everybody was just like oh that's the candy man's house that's, that's the candy man's house and everybody knew it and they they would interview these people and just you know for the last 30 years this is all that i've known um is is that and people i think always wondered are there bodies there yeah i mean imagine even buying the house like uh, thinking like oh if i renovate the kitchen am i gonna find what am bones I gonna find? of a body of a boy in the kitchen and i'm wondering why didn't people stay i mean i i say i just something with that much evil that happened mm -hmm. Maybe if even if you don't believe in spirits or ghosts or entities, I just think just the energy would be of course, bad. yeah, just to know just that in what general, happened the inside those walls, yeah, um, and again, we can go back to like the disclosure, like does that have to be disclosed? I know here in California, I after it, three years, yeah. you do not have to disclose it. This was a huge worldwide known case, so who knows? I'm yeah. sure people knew, um. But I mean, if you weren't somebody who listened to cr true crime and, you know, people move from California over mm -hmm. there every day, you go and just purchase the house and, and I find know. out later on that people are coming to you saying, you know, there were 28 boys tortured yeah, and killed yeah, in this house. Imagine? I would have been, oh, yeah. Yeah. But at one time prior to um, Tim coming in and doing this, the house was on the market for $184,000. And that was just recent. Yeah. So... Again, I don't, I mean, here in California, you can't buy a cardboard box to live in for that. But I, again, I don't know in that area in Pasadena, Texas, I don't know what yeah, houses know. go for, but $184,000, like I said, it's a you still. can't buy a rock to shit under here. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe that's the reason why. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what the houses are going for over there. I know that before they used to be really um, inexpensive uh, considering Based on California prices, of course. you know, I think everything's so it's like irrelevant, <laughs> like in, like you know when you compare. Yeah, but um, I think that's a low price, regardless at this time, because yeah. I think it's really hard to find homes in the hundred thousand dollar range yeah. in any part of the country, mm -hmm. unless you're living in a small little town in the Midwest somewhere. And right, maybe you can find that, but yeah, yeah. So, um, and this is in Houston. It's not even like in the outskirts of Houston it's it's like Pasadena is like it's right the there suburb it's like the and it's a nice little area yeah, like, like it's not a bad area yeah, the bellflower of LA if I want to do yeah. any referencing or anything you know it's like it's not that it's mm -mm. just a suburb outside of mm -hmm. Houston yeah yeah so um Shannon and I were just there January in the in the beginning of January and that's when these pictures were taken of Dean Coral's home that you saw. So, um, just in researching this today, I was surprised to hear this. Um, on February twenty fourth, today is the twenty February twenty sixth. Oh, today's the twenty sixth. Okay. Yes. So two days ago, um, Dean Coral's house on twenty twenty Lamar Road in Pasadena, Texas, was demolished. So the house is no longer there. It's gone. Are there pictures? Yes. Oh. It's gone. We need to put those up. Yeah. That's crazy. Cause we were just there mm -hmm. and it didn't look like they were planning on demolishing didn't. it. I mean, like you said, it the house was had not no windows. A, it was not a rundown house. Uh, uh, no. Um, in fact, the house next door, I believe was getting renovated cause mm -hmm. there was a truck in the driveway. It looked like some guy was working on the house. The yeah. Gardeners or, were, or I don't know. Somebody uh, they was were there. doing something to the house next door, but yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So it's gone. I was surprised to hear that. Yeah. But then, you know, I'm happy. I'm glad. That block needs a I fresh I think start. everybody was. They they had interviewed a couple people um and they had asked, you know, like, how do you how do you feel about this? And and somebody said like, I think this is what the neighborhood needed. Yes. It just needed to be gone. Now again, the house is gone. But that dirt's still there. Yeah. And but I, I'm sure it'll make it easier to excavate underneath the house or wherever they need to do. Yeah. I mean, you said I think that's anything, done. But. They didn't find anything and they used like a new, I forget what it's called, but they used like a certain, a certain way of doing it, um, of going through all of the dirt and everything. So I don't, you know, who knows, but yeah. I don't believe that there's anything they probably else took there. The victim somewhere else. But nevertheless, I just think that land in general will just never be the same. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh. so that is 
Um, that is part one. That ends our of Dean, Dean Coral, Coral, the Candyman. You know, before we went to Texas, we kind of um, chose the chose the uh, cases that we wanted to talk about. Yeah. And when we were researching this, Shannon actually uh, came across a, a very odd connection, <laughs> or not odd, was, I shouldn't yeah. say. I wonder who has, do you remember who has it? Is it Netflix or? I don't remember. Amazon Prime or Paramount it's, Plus? Yeah, I don't know. It's one of them. One of those subscriptions. But, but we'll, put the, we'll put the episode up yeah. here. Um, and it is. The Candyman the and candy the Clown. The Candyman and the Clown. Yeah. The Clown and the Candyman. The Clown and the Candyman, yeah. Something like that. But they kind of tie these two together. Yeah. And it's, it's a, very interesting. It's, it's very, very interesting to hear um, just the information about all of this. And it, it really makes you wonder. Yeah. If there was a connection. So... It's the clown and the candy man. Hulu. On Hulu. Okay. You can find it yeah. on Hulu. So yeah, yeah. So if if any of you guys want to watch that, it's very, very interesting and just about the connection. And it, I might be wrong because it's been a few months since I watched it. But I think there was a third person tied in with them too. I think there was oh. three of them. John Wayne Gacy, Dean Coral, and somebody else. And when we were there, we also visited Dean Coral's grave. Yes. And um, who was he buried next to? Is he buried? His, is it his mom it, or his sister? I thought it was his stepmom. It was his stepmom. Yeah, I thought it was his stepmom. And it I was thought his stepmom. If I was his stepmom, I'd be like, yeah. get him away from me. Yes. I, I was making a guess on why he was buried next to his stepmom. This is my thoughts on it. I don't want to spend any money on my son being buried. <laughs> I'm the father. Yeah. I bought my plot next to my wife. You know, I have a plot next to my wife. Just stick them there. Yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> we were having these conversations yeah. in the cemetery. <laughs> I was like, why? I, I would be, so, he must have not a, a, like, I'd be like, why would you put this yeah. monster next, next to, like, to me? Ooh. Yeah. Nope. 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 Yeah. I'd be so upset. But yeah, he was buried next to his stepmom. I just thought it was because of convenience. Like, you know what I have? I bought, I'm a, sure I bought two plots for me and my wife. This is what it is. My son and went I'll be buried me <laughs> and I just buried me somewhere I don't want to be buried next to him. We didn't even bother looking. Maybe he's still in the same area, but yeah, I, I don't, don't know. know. Who knows? I don't even know if he's passed away, the father, but. But you know. he is, Um. well, I would. I would think, think oh yeah, he, yeah, actually yeah. you're right. Yeah, I would he think was born he would. in 39, so yeah. But yeah. So, yeah, so that is our episode on the Candyman. And make sure to subscribe. Yes. And please, it doesn't take much. Just hit the like button and subscribe. Help and comment. Us out. We love your, yes. we love to hear from you guys, um, all of your comments, um, good or bad suggestions if you have any cases. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more from Texas, I think, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to so. do. And then we're going to probably hit up some here in California. Absolutely. We have we have uh, some cases that are kind of personal to us, people that we know um, that we're trying to get in and in talk to. And have. Yeah, so we have quite a few things lined up. So Absolutely. Yeah, so make sure and check us out on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, all at 50 States of Madness. And if you would like to support us, we are on Patreon at 50statesofmadness.com. Thank you so much. Thanks. And see you next week. Bye.